close encounters recently revealed by U.S. and Soviet scientists involves our first mission to the moon. Astronauts Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins were not there alone. On the third day out, a strange object was spotted, but its distance and shape could not be determined. It disappeared, and the astronauts never knew what they had seen. When they neared the moon, they heard strange noises on their radio, which they thought could be a code. When Apollo 11 landed in a moon crater, Neil Armstrong reported to NASA Mission Control that two large mysterious objects were watching them. These two alien spacecraft landed near the lunar module. Buzz Aldrin took motion pictures of them from inside the module and then continued photographing them from the moon's surface. The aliens took off shortly after Armstrong and Aldrin stepped onto the moon. As the Aldrin pictures were never released by NASA, and there were several interruptions in transmission from Apollo 11, many conclude the suppression and censorship were part of NASA's ongoing cover-up of UFO encounters. Despite government's secretive attitude and the playing down of all reports, ufologists have continued their investigations with fervor. As descriptions of UFOs vary greatly, for more information, we have contacted the world-renowned ufologist Trevor James Constable, who has been cataloging UFO sightings for over 30 years. Uh, with reference to each particular type of uh, photograph that I have taken, there are available similar photographs from other sources that were taken by people actually with little or no knowledge of this uh, phenomenon and usually they were accidentally taken. Here is the original bioform picture that I took in August of 1957. We call that one the amoeba and there are some four successive photographs of this thing taken on infrared film uh, immediately above my head and then on the later exposures against the known background of the desert floor, a place to which you could return any time if you wished. So this one was taken in color by a deputy sheriff, Sheriff Strzok, uh, near St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh, there was a case involving President Carter's uh, personal helicopter. A photograph was made by a civilian employee of the Defense Mapping Agency down there. And she was covering the President's departure. And there are perhaps a hundred people watching the helicopter depart. And here is another one of a very similar type to the President Carter picture that was taken by Lee V. Ertley, a nationally known outdoor writer. This was taken in Utah. Again, the object was invisible when photographed. Here's one that was taken by me above the top of Mount Wilson in 1961, 4,000 feet in the air just shortly after dawn. The object is of the same general type as the two that we've just seen. The objects in the Panama photograph involving President, Hel President Carter's helicopter and the photograph taken by Lee Ertley both of these would, to my evaluation, be manned objects or intelligently constructed objects because it's obvious from the images that force fields of uh, extreme strength are uh, being employed in the propulsion of the uh, disc or discoidal uh, vehicle that appears in there. The picture tells you that uh, this is something that is engineered rather than biological. Here's a bioform taken by Richard Toronto in Vallejo, California, taking a number of photographs of these amoebic-type space critters. 
Here is a photograph of the late George Van Tassel, very well known in UFO research. When this photograph was taken, was addressing a throng of some 2,000 people. The object above his head was not seen by anybody present. High-speed infrared film uh, did make it apparent. These objects are appearing not only in Panama but, or over the Utah desert or in California. They're everywhere. For example, recently here in January of 1979, there was a tremendous controversy erupted over some sightings in New Zealand, in the New Zealand area. The, uh, the clippings are here. And uh, they involve pronouncements about these incidents by uh, purported experts. In fact, the newspapers refer to them as experts. Well, there are no experts in this field. There are only people whose level of ignorance varies. And this is characteristic of much that has gone on since this whole thing broke in on the world. Astronomers and people like this who have some authority and standing immediately jump in with negative opinions over things of which, on which they're not fully informed. All these things involve, to some degree, the activities of governments. And of course, the role of our own government in maintaining secrecy on these things is itself a subject of considerable controversy. San Diego, California UFO researcher Timothy Shanks verifies extensive investigations by many governments, even though most will not acknowledge the existence of UFOs. Work in Europe, they are taking it a lot more seriously than here. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, Brazil is also, England is uh, experiencing a lot of sightings. All over the world, yes, Japan is interested. Uh, the USSR is very much interested. Venezuela, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, Norway, Sweden, the Philippines, Chile, uh, France, and uh, Grenada. Uh, all of these people uh, do officially state that flying saucers do exist, and some of them go even further and say they believe that they come from other worlds. A country that does not believe in the existence of UFOs is a country of deep sleepers. Uh, for instance, America, uh, Russia, uh, and England have studied UFOs for a number of years and I think they have amassed sufficient uh, information to know of their existence but uh, you see they will not officially admit that they know of the existence of uh, unidentified flying objects. Dr. George King, president of the Aetherius Society and international authority on UFO investigations. Trevor Constable jumps into the ongoing governmental controversy. There is, however, no doubt, if one is to believe a distinguished Canadian scientist, that there is, in our country, a super-secret group, a super-secret scientific group through which all this critical UFO, UFO information is channeled. The late Wilbert Smith, who was a scientist with the uh, Canadian government and headed the Canadian government's Project Magnet back in the 1950s in an attempt to penetrate the propulsion secrets of the UFOs, stated in a tape-recorded interview made before his death that certain samples had been forward to hi forwarded to him in Canada from Washington for analysis. And after he made the analysis in Canada, he was required to return the fragments to the super secret agency in Washington. And he specifically stated that the agency was higher than the CIA. So the government is in it up to its neck, uh, despite any press and propaganda releases that the Air Force or anybody else makes to the contrary. They're, they're in it. Dr. Frank E. Stranges, director of the National Investigations Committee on Unidentified Flying Objects, takes a shot at government and its cover-up. I would say in my 30 two or 33 years of UFO investigation, I have found definite evidence of a conspiracy. When we speak of the word conspiracy, it's a group of individuals who gather together with a prime purpose of either doing good or evil to a subject or, an, or another. As far as UFO conspiracy is concerned, yes, there are forces at work to squelch all valid UFO material. The United Nations has gone on record as saying that they would favor open hearings, open investigation, but uh, the first nation to object was the United States, and this is rather comical. 
However, the United States Air Force still contends that UFOs do not pose any threat against the security of the United States, nor does it represent any at more advanced technology other than we can meet. Man's vanity leads him to believe that he is the only intelligence in the universe, but there has to be something else out there. Too many hard facts lead to the conclusion that we are not alone, and some of us are being contacted by other intelligent forces. Dr. King tells of his personal encounter. It's, it's an, it was an amazing happening. It, it's something which really did uh, affect me uh, very, very greatly. I became aware of a presence standing beside me. I did see Jesus physically. He was tall. He wore a robe which had a strange iridescent quality about it. It kind of shone in the light, not like a phosphorescent article does, but in a rather unexplainable way to me. The whole figure made so much light that I could plainly see his face and his features. Beneath the robe, which was divided in the front, I could see that he had a purple belt and in this purple belt there were some jewels they seemed to glow from within in his hand he had a small wand like instrument beneath the robe he had on a jumpsuit type of thing he had long brown hair and surprisingly enough blue eyes he was tanned a golden brown color as though he had been subjected to infrared bombardment had been in the sunlight an awful lot he leveled this wand at me then i lost all consciousness when the master jesus departed he moved over to the side of me and it was then that i regained consciousness i saw a vehicle uh, somewhat similar to this one here, this model here, a, a flying saucer, a scout patrol vessel, and it came down and hovered a few feet above the earth. I'm not sure uh, how many feet, because I kind of saw the bottom of it, and uh, I saw the three little domes on the bottom, and I saw a bright green ray very, very bright green ray come from the bottom of the saucer like this and Jesus stepped to one side into the ray and he disappeared. Uh, I believe he was taken up into the craft in that way because I saw this craft move through the heavens and join two more craft which had been hovering there during the whole experience. Mr. Robert Schoeffler recalls his mysterious encounter. I was sitting in a car and suddenly the car was filled with a brilliant blue light. There was no sound. I looked up to the sky and there was a beam of light coming down towards me. Then it went out and there was nothing there. Another encounter is related by Mr. Armand in an interview in Los Angeles, California. And then I jumped up and stood in front of the tent and a blue one flashed across the side of the mountain. Another one came over the top and lit up about three acres. And I turned to him and I says, Joe, did you see that? And he was, had his head covered up. And I went to shake him. And he says, I'm asleep, leave me alone, leave me alone. And just then our campsite lit up as bright as day. And we blanked out. This photo was taken in Nanking by a Chinese soldier. An oil company employee was taking pictures from a drilling rig in Indonesia when he saw an object in the sky accelerating toward him. With one shot left, he took this photo just before it veered off. Photographic evidence of unidentified flying objects has come from all over the world. In June 1966, about 30 miles north of Albuquerque, New Mexico, this manned spacecraft was captured on film by leading UFO photographer, Paul Villa. Three years earlier, Villa shot this UFO as it passed over his head just above the trees. 
close enough for him to feel its heat. The saucer flipped on its edge, its lower half rotating. Then it traveled sideways while moving up and down. The ship hovered for some time. Mr. Villa estimated its size to be between 160 and 170 feet in diameter. This sighting covered a five minute time span. This photo was snapped near the Sandia Indian Pueblo. The angle at which the picture was taken gives the craft a cigar shaped appearance, but in fact, it was disc shaped. Robert Rinker, a field technician at the Chalk Mountain Laboratory in Colorado, unsuspectingly caught this UFO on film. He doesn't recall seeing it at the time the picture was taken, but did hear motor noises he attributed to a snowmobile. This impressive picture was taken by scientist Dr. Daniel W. Fry. This amoeba-type object is similar to those seen and photographed over Sydney, Australia. This was taken in the desert near Albuquerque, New Mexico on April 18, 1965. Five hours later, in the same area, a second craft was visible for a few seconds. Flares used in a New Jersey civil defense test attracted this UFO. George Adamski shot this near Mount Palomar Observatory in Southern California. This was taken by Dr. Daniel Fry in Riverside, California. Observers from other worlds, intruders from other galaxies. However we describe them, the irrefutable facts are there. Something from somewhere has come. And through the development of the camera, the introduction of infrared photography, refined radar and sonar devices, laser technology, and many other scientific advancements, investigators have been given the tools needed to obtain tangible proof of their existence. One such investigator is Wendell C. Stevens, a retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. I was laying on a lounge chair in the backyard of my home, looking towards the Catalinas, and I saw, I was watching two jet fighters flying by, and as I was looking for them, ranging my eyes, I saw two little lens-shaped objects far beyond the jets, flying in a wobbling sec motion, like a penny falling down in the last stages of falling down, one behind the other. And every time they'd turn in the sunlight, they would glint one after the other, and they continued in a straight line until they disappeared beyond the, the Rincon Mountains to the east. Was there another encounter? The second time was at night. I was, uh, a friend had just left my house going across town, and he was up on the northwest side near Fort Lowell and First Avenue, and he stopped his car and gone to a telephone booth to call me and say, you know those things we were talking about? I think one is going over town right now. And I laid down the phone and went out to look, and sure enough, there was a, a soft, luminous orange ball coming from the direction that he told me to look in. And it came direct, almost directly over my head. And I, it was still approaching, and I ran back in. I told him, yeah, I see it. I'm going to go back outside. He said, wait a minute, there's another one right behind it. So I watched that, and then I watched another. And I, after the third one, I went in back in. I said, yeah, there's quite a few. There's still more coming, and eight of them passed over, one behind the other, about... 30 degrees of arc apart. This is one of the earliest known photographs of a UFO. It was discovered in Old Harbor Records in Oslo, Norway, and is dated July 27, 1907. Fatima, Portugal, 1917. 12,000 people saw this huge UFO, which was photographed by a local newsman. This photo has been published countless times. It was taken in Washington, D.C. on July 29, 1952, of a large cluster of UFOs surrounding the Capitol Building Dome. A Marine Corps pilot, while flying reconnaissance over Korea during the police action of the 50s, spotted this object, gave chase, and was able to get this aerial photo before the unknown darted out of sight. This was shot by an 11-year-old boy in Japan in 1976 and declared authentic by experts. The location was Tainter Lake near Colfax, Wisconsin, April 1978. A man and his girlfriend were enjoying their afternoon of fishing when the sighting occurred. He grabbed his Instamatic camera and shot these photographs during the three to four minute encounter. Mr. Joyce and his wife Norma on an evening walk in Hot Springs, Arkansas, 
spotted this UFO. Wendell Stevens continues. I had had some contact with witnesses in Alaska when I was on a military assignment up there. They experienced uh, close approaches by circular disc-shaped craft over the polar area as we were mapping that region from 1947 to 1950. Although limited in ways of communication and record keeping, there are still many indications that sighting of UFOs and alien encounters occurred thousands of years ago. Over 15 centuries ago, these drawings were made in the Magda Caves high in the Alps, recording an encounter with a spacecraft. Together with the objects most familiar to the early cavemen, such as the bull, horses, and trees, we find over and over again, most faithfully reproduced, other things natural to the environment. Flying disks and cigar-shaped objects that are simply known on Earth today as UFOs. When catalogued by archaeologists, amazing similarities were found between the shapes in the ancient drawings and the pictures being taken by UFO photographers today. If you were to travel south from Lima along the coast of Peru, with the Pacific Ocean on your right and the Andes on your left, you would soon arrive at Nazca, a small, modest agricultural community of hard-working descendants of the pre-Incan Indians. This rugged country has long been of interest to archaeologists, having been the site of the great Incan Empire. In recent years, other scientists and researchers have journeyed to this impoverished area in search of traces of an ancient civilization who kept records of visitations of spaceships and space beings. These researchers feel that much that they have found thus far lends support to the theory that aliens did come to this planet and possibly colonized. They argue that the great achievements made by the Incan Empire are totally unexplainable unless the simple Indian people had been guided by beings of much greater intelligence and knowledge. Throughout this area, startling evidence of alien visitation is found in these explicit rock drawings. Modern Swiss writer Erich von Däniken, in Chariots of the Gods, advances the notion that some 30 to 50,000 years ago, visitors from another star system not only landed on Earth, but interbred with the ancient Indians living in the area, leading to the interesting possibility that the present-day Nazcans are the descendants of those alien visitors of the past. of the great Mayan center at Chichen Itza, we can still see the bas reliefs on the remains of the walls of the great temple of the warriors and the many colorful drawings which depict spacemen and spaceships. The same type of carvings and drawings are found in the ruins at Ushmal. In the days when the Mayan civilization flourished, each community depended on a ceremonial center each with its own identity and architectural style. Yet one thing they all had in common was the picture writing depicting the space beings and their ships. It is, of course, possible that visitors from a more advanced civilization did bring to our planet the knowledge of mathematics and physics that were necessary in the building of the pyramids and Stonehenge. As far back as the Middle Ages, men had no doubts. These huge constructions were the work of unearthly beings. Some of today's researchers believe that Stonehenge was built as a most sophisticated astronomical observatory used for predicting eclipses. But by whom? Surely not the Neolithic farmers who resided on the Salisbury Plain, who were without a system of writing or numerical notation. 
Surely, these simple people were incapable of demonstrating the skill in surveying and geometry necessary for such accomplishments. We have seen photos of alien ships, but we can only speculate on the means used to propel them. Some ufologists believe that these highly intelligent beings have not only discovered the secrets of the natural forces that control the movement of the planets through the universe, but have been able to harness these forces for use as the ultimate power source. To explain this propulsion theory, noted scientist, educator, and UFO lecturer, Chan Thomas. I'm a scientist. I've been involved in the field of cataclysmic geology for about 15 years. This is an unknown science in the English-speaking countries. Well, not exactly unknown, but it's not taught in any formal educational course. It was started in the European countries of France, Switzerland, and Germany in the 1750s. The pursuit of this science leads us to a track which is, uh, requires the solution of the inner energy structure of a planet to explain the periodic geological upheavals which occur all over the planet. Now let's take a look at the cross section of our Earth. First we have an inner core, 860 miles in radius. Outside that, an outer core, 1300 miles thick, which exhibits all the properties of a molten liquid. And then outside that, the mantle, which is 1800 miles thick, which is largely solid. It has a molten layer 60 miles down. Then outside that, the radiation belts, inner belt being protons and the outer belt being electrons. Now it is these radiation belts which draw free energy from space into the planet. And this energy courses through the planet concentrating in the area of the outer core and it's this very concentration that makes the outer core molten. And then it leaves the Earth out the South Pole. And it is the coursing of this energy which makes the Earth rotate west to east once a day. And it is this very energy structure which makes every rotating planet rotate west to east as the energy goes through it. Now, something we've learned from this is that the inner energy structure of every rotating planet is the same, no matter what its size. And it tells us that gravity on the surface of those planets, no matter what the size of the planet, is the same. And I mean gravity in terms of pull per unit area. If you were to go to Saturn or Jupiter, as large as they are, you'd weigh almost the same on the surface as you do right here. This means that life, as we know it, is much more plausible than we were led to believe up to now on any planet, as long as it's rotating, no matter what the size of that planet. This is intriguing, isn't it? dated September 23, 1947, to the Commanding General of the Army Air Forces, Lieutenant General Twining of Air Material Command expressed the opinion that there was sufficient substance in the reports of UFOs to warrant a detailed study. On December 30, 1947, Project Sign, later known as Project Blue Book, was born. In 1956, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, astronomy professor at Ohio State University and astronomical consultant to Project Sign and Project Blue Book, went to the Smithsonian Institute and convinced them to establish a satellite tracking network to obtain information on UFOs. Since 1975, a series of science workshops has examined two questions does extraterrestrial intelligent life exist? And if it does, how can it be detected? The workshop activities were part of a feasibility study on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, better known by the acronym SETI, or SETI. This study was conducted by the NASA Ames Research Center. Thomas Miller offers his theory on propulsion. They do fly interstellarly. Uh, however, they do not fly in the, the same manner that uh, the rocket ships fly or blast off from Earth as we know it. 
they used the electromagnetic lines of force which permeate the universal substance of this galaxy. The brothers on the other planets have evolved much more rapidly than uh, the people on the Earth, and the ones that we have contacted have transmitted their messages to Earth, and uh, they have given us pertinent information of uh, instrumentations which they will help us build and construct when they do make physical contact, such as a, uh, an energy device which will use the natural oscillation of atom structures themselves. We will be taught how to arrange the vibrancy of the atoms to extract natural energy emanations from the very atom substances and siphon them off into power stations. And uh, it will be a free type of energy. Mr. Carl Anderson, an employee of the U.S. Navy in Long Beach, California, one of the many people who claim to have been abducted by aliens, describes propulsion systems as explained to him by his abductors. Space people describe how the ship was propelled. Uh, yes, they told me <clears throat> all about the propulsion of the ship. Uh, in fact, they told me that the interplanetary spacecraft are what we've come to call flying saucers. Uh, and uh, they told me that the craft was essentially a flying electrical motor. The field uh, coil turning in one direction, the uh, uh, rotor or the uh, uh, armature going in the opposite direction, uh, propelled by a power in the center, such as a battery uh, of a type which we're not familiar with. Uh, <clears throat> they told me that when these two counter-rotating sources revolve uh, to a speed relative to the Earth as it turns in its axis in relation to its mass, that it becomes weightless due to the fact that the electromagnetic lines of force thrown off by the craft repel the magnetic lines of force that the Earth create and thus uh, propel it away from the Earth's surface. Now by reverse polarity, uh, this can be made to attract and uh, thus pull back toward the planet again. By neutralizing this effect uh, between the attraction and the repelling force, this is how they are known to hover in one spot. Dr. King is in closer agreement with Mr. Thomas. We have the large mother craft. Uh, these can be tremendous size. Uh, they have a capability of, um, shall we say, tuning into uh, natural magnetic forces which do flow very fr freely through this galaxy and uh, transferring that into kinetic energy. The usual type of scout patrol vessel, uh, like uh, that, that in this little uh, model here, which, by the way, is made exactly to scale. This is a model of a scout patrol vessel, which is uh, about 32 and a half feet in diameter. Now, uh, this uh, uh, vessel here has three uh, propulsion units. One I won't mention at this time, it's too complex. Uh, the other, again, it's capable of tuning into the uh, natural flow of forces throughout the universe. But the third one is very interesting. Uh, as these vehicles operate for the most part uh, quite near to a planetary mass, such as Earth or another planet, they're able to reverse the flow of gravity. Uh, the space people know, by the way, that gravity has two poles, rather like a magnet. A uh, magnet has a north and a south pole. Gravity has a positive and negative pole. And they're able to reverse the flow of this gravity so that a planetary mass can repel the vehicle or attract it. Uh, this is... Uh, often the reason why some scout patrol vessels fly in a rather, uh, shall we say, um, uh, erratic uh, manner. This is an artist's impression of the third satellite. On the top, there is a huge crystalline dome for collecting the sun's energies. At the bottom, there's a power matrix for transmitting the sun's energies after they have been conditioned by the enormous crystals within the craft. This next drawing gives you a rough idea of the position of the third satellite. 
You see the impression of the sun, the energies being collected by the dome at the top and transmitted to Earth through the power matrix at the bottom. This alien was photographed in Milan, Italy, before the shouts of other witnesses frightened it away. These alien figures became visible only after the film was developed. Sir Cedric Allingham, former RAF pilot, photographed this giant alien in Scotland. In 1973, a family, while traveling near Mexico City, encountered this strange object. They fled the scene after getting these photos, which have been declared genuine by Robert Padilla, Special Service Director of Kodak, Mexico. Near Rio de Janeiro on October 8, 1977, Antonio La Rubia, a bus driver, walked to a large field near his home to wait for his ride to work. It was 2.15 in the morning, and the dim light made it difficult to identify the enormous leaden object blocking his path. Suddenly, an intense blue light eliminated the field, and three robot-like creatures appeared beside him. The next thing he was aware of was being inside a ship and being examined by the aliens, at which time he claimed they took a sample of his blood and made drawings with it on a TV-like screen. The next thing he knew, the spacecraft had disappeared and he was standing in front of the bus terminal where he worked. Persistent hounding by the press drove La Rubia into seclusion. In May of 1977, an Air Force officer and his son were driving in the country near Buenos Aires when the youngster spotted a huge capsule in the sky which ejected three luminous objects, then took off. Moments later, the three scouts disappeared in the same direction. A commercial pilot was returning to Rio de Janeiro from the International Airport. About a mile from the field, he saw an object in the sky. These are photos taken of the Saturn-shaped object which had been hovering between two airport runways. A young architect in Maldonado, Uruguay, was driving home when bright light flashed in the sky and he saw this silvery object. Fortunately for his reputation in the community, a lady in a nearby farmhouse verified the sighting. Others relate their experiences with alien beings. Robert Short tells of his strange encounter. My first encounter was in October 1958 with what I claim to be an extraterrestrial being that I have since found out comes from the planet we call Saturn in our solar system. It was, to me at the time, a very frightening experience. The being said to me, we have come down to make an adjustment in the power of our craft. We will see you at a future time. Mr. Robert Schofler. I found myself going to Orcas Island in Washington, uh, Key West in Florida, Palenque and Chichen Itza on the Yucatan, Teotihuacan in Mexico City. And each of these places, I met beings. They would come up to me and know who I was, not by name, but why I was there. And they had similar purposes. Doctors King and Strangers disagree. All the people in this solar system are friendly disposed towards Earth, and they are very, very advanced uh, people. But uh, there, there are other people in other parts of, uh, well, not only this galaxy, but galaxies beyond this, that have not been friendly. In fact, uh, the solar system has been uh, attacked by outside forces uh, in the last few years, uh, and uh, in order to repel these forces, uh, there was something which we might call a galactic war. UFOs have uh, had this Earth under surveillance for many thousands of years, and if they were going to attack or cause the human race any problems, they would have done so a long time ago. But there have been a few cases where some cattle and some people have even suffered because of so-called negative saucers. Someone said if these are intelligent beings from outer space, they couldn't be too intelligent if they're visiting the planet Earth. But on the other hand, I believe that we have been a source of, uh, uh, shall we say, potential threat 
because as one scientist put it, we can take and set the atmosphere on fire with hydrogen devices, and this could cause the planet Earth to be completely destroyed by fire, and in so doing, it could disturb the other planets in our solar system. Mr. Thomas Miller. They will be landing very soon, as soon as the Earth man receives the Space Brothers in an open, receptive way where they would lay down their hatreds. Because the Space Brothers bring a whole new way of life which will restructure society as a whole. We will start to tear down the various prejudices which we have had against life on other planets, life in other worlds. Chan Thomas discusses solar energy. Let's take a look at what would happen were we to build a model of this. You know, this is a pretty good space vehicle. Oh yes, it's limited to be sure. It only orbits and rotates. But it's been doing a pretty good job for almost five billion years of just orbiting and just rotating. Well, let's build a model in which we can control more than nature controls a planet. And let's build an inner core which instead of being solid is hollow. And let's build an outer core around it which we'll call the shell of this model. And let's leave off the mantle because planets when they're born don't have any mantles. Our mantle has grown on it since it was born. And let's have this vehicle uh, with its own radiation belts, inner belt of protons and the outer belt of electrons. And these actually form donut lenses, as I like to call them, to draw free energy from space into this model. And it courses around the inner core. Now, with the polar structure, unlike that of planet, first with one north pole, as any planet has, but three south poles instead of one south pole on our model. And somehow in this, I won't go into to the technical details here, but somehow within this vehicle, this model, let's retain the ability of taking this energy as it courses around the model and distributing it to any one, two, or three of the south poles. So that the energy leaving is not like a planet just out the south pole. We can make it go out in any direction we want to, horizontally if we want to, or vertically, by summing the outputs of the three poles. What we have done here is to build a freely navigating planet. And we can build it to any size we want, small, large, and we find that the larger we build it, the easier it is to build it. In essence, what we've done is to build a vehicle which will do everything that these UFOs are supposed to be doing as claimed by the people who have seen them. Well, what about UFOs? I really don't care whether they exist or not. I think the problem is to build one. Let's get on with the business of building these vehicles. And if the UFOs are there, we'll join them. And if they're not there, look how far ahead we'll be. Over the past few decades, there has been increasing debate about the existence of intelligent life in space. More recently, there has been a growing interest in the ways of detecting intelligent extraterrestrial life forms. In a letter dated September 23, 1947, to the Commanding General of the Army Air Forces, Lieutenant General Twining of Air Material Command expressed the opinion that there was sufficient substance in the reports of UFOs to warrant a detailed study. On December 30th, 1947, Project Sign, later known as Project Blue Book, was born. In 1956, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, astronomy professor at Ohio State University and an astronomical consultant to Project Sign and Project Blue Book, went to the Smithsonian Institute and convinced them to establish a satellite tracking network to obtain information on UFOs. Since 1975, a series of science workshops has examined two questions. Does extraterrestrial intelligent life exist? And if it does, how can it be detected? The workshop activities were part of a feasibility study on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, better known by the acronym SETI, or SETI. 
This study was conducted by the NASA Ames Research Center. Project Blue Book, begun as Project Sign in 1947, assigned its staff to carry out three main functions. First, try to find an explanation for all reported sightings of UFOs. Second, determine if UFOs pose any threat to the security of the United States. Third, determine if UFOs could contribute any advanced technical or scientific knowledge. Blue Book officers were stationed at every Air Force base in the nation. The project produced what the Air Force considered a satisfactory explanation for most of the nearly 13,000 sightings reported through 1969. Of the unexplained UFO incidents, the official statement is, the description of the object or its motion cannot be correlated with any known object or phenomenon. On the basis of Blue Book reports, the Air Force drew the following conclusions. First, no UFO has ever given any indication of threat to the national security. Second, there is no evidence that UFOs represent technology beyond present-day scientific knowledge. Third, there is no evidence that any UFOs are extraterrestrial vehicles. Many skeptics charged that the Air Force was not telling all that it knew and the transfer of the responsibility of UFO research from the Air Force to the University of Colorado in 1969 did little to end the suspicions and outright accusations of cover-up and censorship. It is interesting to note that while the Air Force was in charge of the UFO investigations, they spent U.S. tax dollars quite freely, employing top scientists, the FBI, the CIA, and many special armed forces investigators. For nearly 30 years, the Air Force kept its files classified. But now, with the release of the Project Blue Book reports to the public, you can read for yourselves the actual interviews, reports, and transcribed conversations of witnesses to UFO activity and draw your own conclusions. UFOlogists now agree we must turn to the scientific community, not the military, for UFO investigations. Scientists differ in their speculations as to the kind of life forms which may exist in outer space. The Soviets seem committed to the idea but it would be essentially the same kind of life as exists here on Earth, from bacteria to man. In Western scientific circles, many possibilities are explored. Life based on ammonia, or even inorganic compounds. All over the world, researchers are simulating the conditions of other planets in the laboratory in order to see if bacteria and other simple organisms can survive. In many cases, the Earth bacteria has shown remarkable endurance and adaptability. Mineralogists, physicists, and biologists are hard at work studying meteorites, as they are the only extraterrestrial bodies available. The proof of the existence of organic substances in meteorites would support the existence of life outside the Earth. If there are extraterrestrial civilizations out there, what is the best way to communicate with them? With our present technology, we can only hope the radio signals we are beaming into the galaxy will be heard and answered. Some say we have been heard and that UFOs are explorers who have come to study the source of the transmissions. During the last solar eclipse of the 20th century, Dr. Pallor Halson, a local dentist, took several photos from his vantage point on the beach in Iceland. He did not know until his film was processed that he had photographed this UFO. 
A few miles down the beach, Mr. K.G. Jensen of Germany was there to record the historic eclipse. Jensen did, however, notice the UFO and deliberately photographed it. Several other people reported seeing the UFO that day. This was taken in Lublin, Poland, August 30th, 1977, by a photographer who still lives behind the Iron Curtain and asked to remain anonymous. Patricia Monin tells her story. It was January 1977. As we came to the station where my father is a customs officer, when we came upon this thing which sat motionless in the sky. Professor A.Y. Bonillo took this on August 12, 1883. Millions of light years separate us from other galaxies. So even though the thought of interplanetary travel is most appealing to the human imagination, it is not possible with our present technology. However, there could be civilizations in the universe that are far more advanced than we are, that have developed not only the means for communication, but also the means of interplanetary transportation. Mr. Woody Atkins deliberately set out to photograph UFOs reported in the vicinity of Lawrence, South Carolina on January 31st, 1978. He had two cameras, both equipped with ultraviolet filters. The two rolls of film were sent to different labs for processing. The original slides from roll one were lost. But fortunately, the originals were returned on the second roll, and they were computer enhanced. These are the results of that procedure. Notice the amoeba-like appearance of the object after being examined by the computer. This particular form of UFO has been the subject of great study by Trevor James Constable, pioneer UFO investigator. Amongst the things that I've discovered, I feel that the most important is the establishment of two main classes of these objects. In other words, the introduction of what I consider to be the first qualitative element in the whole subject. This is the division of these multiform phenomena into two main separate divisions. On the left, the most commonly accepted and commonly recognized uh, bracket of phenomena, those objects that appear to be structured ships capable of interplanetary space flight or flight even beyond that. In other words, high performance craft. And on the right, in the other main bracket, are living organisms that are native to our atmosphere and which represent a whole new branch of biology and indeed a complete biological revolution. And I'm the individual who first extensively photographed this level of life, although it has been sporadically photographed through the years, accidentally photographed by many people. And uh, these days, even Kenneth Arnold, the man who first put the term flying saucers into the English language, he himself now accepts that these atmospheric fauna, for want of a better term, I call them the critters, that they constitute a very substantial body of the totality of what we now call UFOs. The crucial thing was the use of infrared film, film that is sensitive to heat as well as to light. And this simple substance, which has been in existence for, oh, at least 75 years, it's the principles of sensitizing film to react to heat, have been known for at least that long enables you to double the size of the window with which you look at the universe. It's a very simple concept. If I use this uh, playing card here, for example, to represent the size of the window that the human eye has on reality, with uh, violet at this end and red at that, then that is the foundation of our 
conceptions of the universe and life and, and of UFOs. But if you take infrared film, what that does, without your necessarily seeing it, is increase the size of the window until it is that big. And so you're seeing almost twice what the unaided human eye sees. And this, uh, over a long period of years, has yielded, I would say, the largest single body of evidence gathered by one person as to the uh, nature of these things that's in existence. The critters, as I call them, the living organisms of whatever kind in the atmosphere that are unseen. And they are self-contained mind-body units just like we are. A human being, when all said and done, is a, an integrated mind-body unit. And these organisms are of the same order as that, although much lower on the evolutionary scale than we are. On the other side, you have what are obviously manned constructs. They are devices of some type that are propelled by manipulations of energy that we do not yet technically understand and to which we are just beginning to gain fringe access. But the two aspects of UFOs, the critters on the one hand and the craft on the other, each of which have to be given equal value in an objective investigation, these two things are mutually confused because the energy form involved is the same. The energy that propels the critters is used technically by the ships. That's the way I conceive of it as being put together. One of the most interesting aspects of the UFO syndrome is the recurrence of reports of abductions of Earthlings by aliens from outer space. One of the oldest organizations involved in an investigation of abductions is the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, headquartered in Tucson, Arizona. We interviewed its co-founder, Mr. Jim Lorenzen. Scientific consultant staff and uh, investigators around the world. We collect reports from all around the world and we analyze these reports and make some judgments as to their, their merit. And uh, we accumulate a library which is uh, available to scientists to study. Uh, this is a job that has not been undertaken by anyone else. We feel it's a need that, uh, that really uh, needs to be fulfilled. Travis Walton was in the National Forest uh, in uh, central Arizona in company of six other people. They saw at close hand an unidentified flying object. Travis approached it and was struck by a beam of some kind which knocked him down. The other people fled the scene. Uh, when they saw some light, lighted object apparently leave the scene, they came back to look for Travis, but they didn't find Travis. Travis showed up five days later at a different location and he told of having been held aboard some craft by strange aliens. Uh, that's the, uh, the essence of the story. Uh, it was quite a difficult one to investigate. When Travis uh, first appeared after this experience, he was in bad physical shape, and our first approach there was to get him to some medical doctors. The witnesses in the Travis Walton case uh, were subjected to polygraph tests because they were suspected of having done away with Travis. And uh, the test took place five days after the incident. Uh, all of the six that took the test passed except one, and his test was de determined to be, uh, uh, to, uh, be just uh, no test because he couldn't calm down even in answering his own name. He was upset about the idea that he might have done something to Travis. Uh, but they, all these men passed the, the test that they had seen an object. Travis was subjected to the first test 10 days after his disappearance, and that test was poorly administrated and it was done under bad circumstances, and he failed it. We went back uh, testing under the ideal conditions, and he passed, and he has since then passed additional tests, and he has uh, passed the PSE test administered by the inventor of the machine. Uh, the PSE test uh, determines stress in the voice, uh, the assumption being that a person uh, lying will show stress in the same way that uh, polygraph picks up stress. Now, uh, 
we use this quite often uh, when we have just single witness testimony and we have it on tape because all we need is the tape. So it's a very convenient tool to for truth verification. We conclude that Travis Walton was telling the truth about a real occurrence to the best of his ability. In the most unusual encounter ever reported, an Italian security guard was abducted for an incredible fourth time. Fortunato Zanfreta of Genoa, Italy, has been hypnotized, given truth serum, and subjected to intensive questions. But his story is unshakable. Zanfreda's first two abductions, both in December of 1978, were followed by another in July of 1979. Then on December 2nd, 1979, a year after the first abduction, he was kidnapped again. After the last occurrence, eyewitnesses reported seeing the alien spaceship take off only a short distance from where Zanfreda was found. Jim Lorenzen tells of the Walton investigation. This uh, young man in question contacted us by mail, sent us some photographs that he'd taken. And uh, our first uh, approach then was to analyze the photographs to see if there was any probability that they were hoaxed. Uh, they seemed to be genuine, so our next step then was to contact the young man and to check somewhat into his background and to become acquainted with him. Then our approach from there on is sort of like uh, criminal in investigation. Uh, we subjected his testimony to uh, PSC, and uh, he took a polygraph test to verify uh, the truthfulness of his testimony. And also, since the man did report that he was abducted and that he saw aliens aboard a strange craft, we have had him draw what he saw aboard the craft. And we are also having an artist produce a model of the alien that he described. This is a model of an alien based on information supplied to artists by abductees William Herman and Travis Walton. Artist Alan Levine created this sculpture. Using the same procedures followed by police departments when investigating a crime, artist Levine was able to arrive at this likeness of the alien. Sketches were made while the abductee described the creature, and after these were corrected, Levine proceeded with the sculpture. This was a painstaking endeavor, as the witnesses did not always agree. Both men agreed on the almond-shaped eyes, small nose and mouth, the unusual position of the ears, and the large hairless skull, and although the alien does have a mouth, all communication was telepathic. We try not to coach uh, the witnesses in any manner by facial expression, because we find, for instance, that quite often the, uh, the subject of some kind of an encounter is looking to us for answers and is trying to please us. So we have to avoid that part in order to get an objective report. Um, I think that uh, uh, our first concern that we always show is the welfare of, of the witness. Abductee Robert Short. I began to understand that my work would be through the auspices of the solar government on Saturn in this system. Helen Michaels tells of his abduction. I was enveloped in a shaft of light. And as I went up this shaft of light, I just looked back, saw my body, and went right up out of it into a mothership in outer space. Your memory is very vivid, very sharp. There is a very strange phenomenon which has occurred in many cases of abduction. The victim has no conscious memory after seeing the spacecraft. They do not remember being kidnapped. Vicki Davis didn't remember being abducted until she was regressed under hypnosis by a qualified medical doctor. Her only clue to her abduction was a recurring nightmare. Because she does not wish the publicity or notoriety, the doctor treating Vicki has asked to remain anonymous. 
This actual hypnosis session has been edited due to time limitations. From this point on, you can speak without coming out of the trance. As you speak, you'll tend to stay very deeply in the trance. Your memory is very vivid, very sharp. And you begin to re-experience in vivid detail everything that happened to you on that night. And from this point on, you can speak without coming out of the trance. As you speak, you'll tend to stay very deeply in the trance. So just begin telling us what you're experiencing, what you're seeing. Driving into the rest area, and we're getting out of the car and going to the bathroom. And we're looking for a phone. Why do you want a phone, Vicky? Because we've seen some type of a crash. A big light in the sky. It was terrible. And we want to call the police to tell them. Do you find a phone? There's no phone. What do you do then? My my mom looks up at the pretty stars and and I look over by the entrance and see a white cloud. It's coming closer. Maybe there's specks all around. Little gold things running all around. And I, I'm walking towards it. I'm, I'm looking up. It's big and round. Can you see into it? Are there windows? No. What do you see inside? I'm on a table now. Like like a table, but it's not a table. How is it like a table? It's long and it's off the ground. Do you know how you got there? No. Tell us tell us what happened on the table. Can you tell us about that? His light coming from it. And they have some type of a thing. When you say that there are some things, can you be more specific and tell us what sort of things you're talking about? They're big energies. Very glowing and they move. They're Do they have a, do they have a shape that you can describe? They sort of have like a head and like arms, but they don't really have feet. And they're glowing, changing. How do they move? They just float, bob. Are there any noises coming from them? Do they have eyes, faces? They have some black spots. Two black spots. How many are there? Three, four. And what are they doing to you on the table? They're looking me over with some type of a thing. It's, it's a machine type of a thing. It has light. Our cameras were allowed to be present when Brian Scott went into a self-induced hypnotic trance. 
During the trance, his eyes rolled back in his head, and he spoke in a voice which claimed to be Voltar, an alien from another planet. Testing proved the voice was not that of Brian Scott. Gunner, call. Zero two zero, zero two zero. We understand that the probe wishes to impart information at this time. We are willing to receive this information now. Acknowledge. Unity. Transfer. Voltar. Delay factor. Seven. Relay. Open. Daniel. Physical. Energy. Displaced. Unity. That's the council. Dr. King discusses the cataclysmic results of alien intervention on our planet. There were ancient civilizations in chronological order. Lemuria came first, and some people believe that this was where the Pacific Ocean is now, and uh, mankind rate, uh, reached quite a high stage of evolution in Lemuria, uh, so high, in fact, that he discovered uh, how to split the atom. And, uh, of course, mankind being what he is, a very warlike creature, um, well, the result was the destruction of Lemuria. And also, the uh, Earth at that time did flip uh, a few degrees on its axis. Um, later on, we had another civilization uh, built up again from the atomic ruins of the last, and that was Atlantis. Now, it's interesting uh, thing about Atlantis is this, that at one time uh, science uh, can prove that the whole of Europe was covered with uh, deep snow and ice. And some catastrophe happened very quickly which altered the course of the Gulf Stream so that it flowed uh, nearer to the coast of Europe and up through and actually near the tip of the uh, north of Scotland. Uh, some people believe that this was a part of the uh, continent of Atlantis going down. Two of the most ancient books on Earth are now translated from the Sanskrit uh, into English, uh, and they do talk about Vimanas, which were, were flying machines, and they do talk about two atomic weapons that were used. One, uh, the Brahma weapon, uh, and the other called Indra's Dart. Uh, there was an atomic war, and the result of this atomic war was the destruction of Atlantis. Uh, again, it's very interesting to note that people are now making quite some discoveries in this regard. For instance, they found a huge road about a hundred foot beneath sea level. This road is made of very, very large stones which do not belong in that area, and these stones are fit very, very closely together. Uh, the stones, they estimate, weigh hundreds of tons each, and it's possible that the uh, Atlanteans had powers uh, which we do not have today. Are they trying to communicate with Earth through Vicky? What is the meaning of this strange writing which bears a remarkable resemblance to the ancient Sanskrit? What is the meaning of Prayana? Could it be the planet or solar system where Vicky's abductors came from? Doctor, is Vicky's case uh, 
valid or unusual? Yes. I believe that she had a very valid experience, and this is corroborated by the uh, regression of her mother to the same event. And while her mother was not abducted, her mother did describe a period of time lapse. Why do you, as a highly regarded medical doctor, investigate these abductee cases? Because I've had a personal UFO experience. I have seen UFOs in my own experience. And that's why I am interested in it. Was that a frightening or traumatic experience for you? No. Simply a sighting. I see. Uh, do you think someone could be abducted or taken away and have no conscious memory of such an occurrence, Doctor? Not forever, no. I think it can be temporarily blocked, yes. Doctor, are you treating others with experiences uh, similar to Vicky's? Yes, there are several, maybe three or four, that are possible abductees. They're still in the preliminary stages, and we need to have further investigative sessions with them. Is hypnosis always an effective tool in these abduction cases? That varies with the individual. Everybody uh, differs in their ability to go into hypnosis, and also they vary in their ability to go into a depth of hypnosis. Um, it requires a fairly deep trance for regression. Could you tell us a little more about regression, Doctor, and how it works? Regression is simply taking the person back in time, in memory, to an event that had significance to him. Police departments now use hypnosis to try to learn the truth in criminal cases. Are you aware of this? And if so, what is your opinion? Yes. I think they're using it more and more, although I question the validity of such investigations because... Dixie Yatarian has asked her opinion of the possibility of extraterrestrials visiting our planet. I, would, I wouldn't want to discount the possibility, but I have to tell you that I'm a skeptic as far as the, most of the claims that are made. I feel that we probably are, well, that we would have to have tremendous egos if we were to feel that we're the only life forms throughout all of the universes. But I honestly don't feel that there are very many people who have had any contact with them. Tell me, Dixie, how do you explain the fact that even under testing, the abductees' stories remain unchanged? You know, in my classes, I teach um, my students to go into a meditation in which they have uh, an experience in which they go up onto a mountain and, and then they materialize for themselves an old man who has all knowledge and they can ask all kinds of questions to this person. The person is actually an aspect of their own personality. Um, and if they were to have had such an experience in a meditation, meditative state without being told first that this was an aspect of their own personality, they might think that this was an extraterrestrial being or something. It's uh, very possible that these people are in contact with some aspect of their own personality and are just uh, self-deluded. I, I honestly don't believe most of the uh, experiences, although I have to say that most of the people I've talked with who claim such experiences are very sincere. They really believe. To those who have had these experiences, they are very real. One such person is retired Air Force Colonel James McNamara, former press advisor and public information officer to General Van Fleet with the 8th Army in Korea. He is presently involved with city government in Los Angeles, California. Colonel McNamara. During my twofold career as a radio news reporter and a military man of some 23 years of service, I've encountered a number of incidences in the field of UFOs or unidentified flying objects to honestly believe that they are here, that they are real. For example, in 1954, I'm convinced that I had a sighting 
of a triangular formation of flying saucers over the coast of Santa Monica. At that time, I had reason to look to the skies. I was on a street intersection in Los Angeles, some six or seven miles east of the city boundary of Santa Monica, and I was surveying the skies because I had been doing radio broadcasts for some time and had been capping them with weather forecasts. Unfortunately, the weatherman had been erroneous for the past two or three days, so I was looking to the skies to see if tonight he was perhaps right in predicting April showers. Now, my gaze was captured by three luminous disks over the coast of Santa Monica, arranged in triangular fashion. I watched these disks for approximately a minute, and then suddenly, with intervals of two or three seconds between the disappearance of each disk, they disappeared, one followed by another, and they all went in a path of a northwesterly direction, leaving no trail whatsoever behind them. And what was incredible was the fact that they seemed to vanish as if the sky was nothing more than a sponge. That's how fast they seemed to disappear. Several months later, I had the opportunity of covering a story for a magazine, Pageant Magazine, a story, the locale of which was in San Fernando Valley. This had to do with a UFO sighting and a subsequent cropping of some very fine material, mysterious material, if you will, which I like to call angel's hair because it resembled the angel's hair which we decorate our Christmas trees. Now, the story itself was not too impressive to me. It was an impressive story, but the real impressive thing to me was the fact that the United States Air Force dispatched a major to interview me as the author of the story and the people to whom I talked to get the story, which demonstrated to me that the United States Air Force regards the UFO and any phenomena attached to UFO certainly is within the realm of possibility and probability certainly not on the borderline of science fiction. Mr. Michael Barton, California author and lecturer, does not doubt his experiences. The people who were with him at the time of the sightings believe it, too. I have seen UFO on a number of occasions. One time at Harmony Grove, California, when we were at a convention a saucer did appear, and a number of people saw the flying saucer directly over the lecture hall. This was in 1960. Uh, recently, as, uh, as recently as July 15th, 1965, I was with a party of six people, and we did observe three UFO demonstrating their maneuvers over Lake Elsinore, California, for three and one half hours. We observe them through binoculars. Colonel McNamara concludes. I have talked during my career as a reporter with many, many people who have had sightings of UFOs and who have given me the complete impression that they too, as I feel, believe that UFOs are real and that there are visitors here in our Earth from outer space. Alan Michaels makes a startling claim. There are some two million people in telepathic bodies on this planet now, making ready to receive Earth people to bring them into the kingdom of God. Dr. King claims. There are at least three people from another planet living on Earth today. Ruth Norman known as Space Ruthie, while preparing for the arrival of more extraterrestrials, speaks from a California base. Greetings, Earth people. I am your Space Fleet Coordinator. I'm the forerunner for the space people who will be landing before long now on your Earth planet. I am the messenger and the forerunner and ambassador from many of the spiritual worlds and the physical planes and the astral dimensions who have come to this, your Earth planet, to introduce you people to a higher way of life. Dixie, if aliens were to contact someone here on Earth, who do you think it would be? 
Well, first of all, I think that they would probably contact some of our great minds, uh, some of our political leaders. I really don't think that they would channel through so-called mediums and uh, give information about uh, the, the nitty-gritty affairs of a person's life, these mediums who claim to be channels for extraterrestrial beings. People come to them and ask about their love life and their business concerns. I really don't think extraterrestrials would be interested in that. There are many, many, countless thousands of people who live here who have incarnated here, but not who have come via spaceship. They're self-deluded. I really believe that. Most of them. I, I wouldn't want to make that a blanket statement. The ones I've met. Um, I think it's really dangerous what they're doing. Mainly, as I wrote in my book, um, I've seen too many cases of people getting involved with these people and watching a trans mediumship sort of experience and then going home and thinking, gee, I could do that. And they go into a trans experience and maybe contact some aspect of their own personality that they've sublimated, some fear or anger, um, and then bringing that forth and not being able to deal with it and they end up on a psychiatrist's couch or at their priest's. Not all sightings can be dismissed as unreliable. An object standing still in the sky over England was photographed by an airline pilot taking home movies while on holiday. It hovered for quite a long time, and he knew it was definitely not an airplane. He continued filming it as it streaked across the sky, leaving a visible trail. This film was turned over to the British military intelligence for examination. After extensive investigations, they were unable to identify the streaking object, and they classified it a UFO. This rotating craft was hovering over the trees in Merlin, Oregon, when photographed on 16 millimeter motion picture film by Dr. Daniel W. Fry. The same rotating ship was also photographed 700 miles away in Joshua Tree, California. Dr. George King. Almost always uh, when people have a close proximity sighting, that is a UFO very uh, near to the road, for instance, if they're driving along in their car, the uh, car uh, engine will stop and the headlights will go out uh, etc. This is common. Uh, it's happened all over the world. From his patrol car, Val Johnson saw a bright light in the sky. He recalls only the sound of shattering glass. Then, he was 854 feet from where he started. The engine was dead, the clock and his watch were stopped, and his face and eyes were burned. Based on the many unanswered questions facing scientists and researchers in the field of unidentified flying objects, the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life must continue. We must, as recommended by SETI, establish a listening network with greater capacity, perhaps by the use of space probes or other satellites. If we do not find intelligent life elsewhere, we will have learned how precious our human culture is and stress our responsibilities to the preservation of our planet. On the other hand, were we to hear but a single extraterrestrial signal, we would know one great truth. It is possible for a civilization to maintain an advanced technological state and not destroy itself.